I have a question for you. <clears throat> Hands up all of you that are studying philosophy at universities or have done so in the past. Oh, oh, and they are, and they are not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> my word, my word, my word. Well, I'll tell you folks, I am so sorry for you. <laughs> my heart bleeds for you. You know, I, I know what happens. I've been there myself many years ago. You know, you, you go to university, you're bright-eyed and uh, full of hope that you're going to learn great things and learn great ideas, and you're in for one hell of a disappointment. But cheer up, I've got some good news for you. If you study real philosophy, that is a wonderful experience. It is such a wonderful experience, it can change, it will change your life, actually. And I wrote a book, which some of you might have read, History of Philosophy, and it's as if you're being introduced to geniuses, great geniuses, giants, giants of human thought, heroes of civilization. And now, in all the universities, you're no longer in the company of heroes and giants. You are trapped forever in an endless, barren, dusty, dry desert inhabited by dwarfs and pygmies. That's all disrespect to dwarfs and pygmies. I've got nothing to say. I'm referring to mental dwarfs and pygmies. Now, the subject that's been given to me to speak on it's got a, it's an interesting title. Dialectics, the algebra of revolution. That phrase actually was not a phrase by Marx or, or Engels. It was actually a phrase used by the great uh, Russian revolutionary democrat, Alexander Herzen. And that was before uh, Marx and Engels wrote their works on philosophy. It, it refers to, the, to Hegel's dialectic, which itself is a magnificent, glorious, edifice of thought, staggering in its profundity and its scope. But there's a problem. Hegel was an idealist. And here the dialectic appears in a kind of semi-mystified form. I'll say a little bit about Hegel's work later on. But you see, if you take the trouble to, to study Hegel, as I have done for many decades, actually since I was 16 years of age, I met a guy, an old chap from the Communist Party in Swansea, name was Sam Knight. He was retired at the time. Sam Knight, his name was. And uh, he used to ask me to come, uh, come to his house every Friday night. I'd rush from school, 16 years of age. And he'd sit me down and we'd discuss and, and, and read The Phenomenology of Mind by Hegel. You know, I, I fell in love with Hegel at that time. And this love has stayed with me all my life. By the way, I'm not the only one. There's a letter some, one, one time written by, by Engels, oh, when, he, when Engels was an old man. He mentions Hegel, and he said, how I love the old guy, how I love the old guy. And anyone that knows Hegel knows what that means. And yet in Hegel, the dialectic, dialectic does appear in a strange and mystified form. If you, if you persevere to read, for example, The Phenomenology of Mind, it's a big, thick book, perhaps you won't want to read all of it. Okay, I, I might suggest that you read just the preface, just the introduction. That alone is over 100 pages, and it's full of the most brilliant insights, the most profound insights you could think of. You know, like, like when he, refer, he compares the dialectical process to the, 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 to the phases of the growth of a plant, like a rose. I'm speaking from memory. The bud, the bud disappears when the flower breaks through and might therefore be considered to be a negative expression, an unreal expression of the life of the plant. But, but the life of the plant precisely consists of one stage after another, which, which negates and, pre and preserves at the same time. Think about it. And he says, the life of the plant is this process of constant growth and change in which one particular stage or phase is negated. It's canceled. It's destroyed but at the same time it's preserved and carried to a higher, higher stage. That paragraph has stuck in my mind ever since I read it. When I was 16 years of age, I read that. But of course, it, it, this is distorted dialectic, and, and therefore, Herzen's expression, the algebra of revolution, is very appropriate. 
In algebra, as you know, there are unknown quantities. In algebra, there are unknown quantities, indicated by letters A, X, Y, Z, which must be gradually filled in to complete the equation. That is true of, the he of Hegel's dialectic. It's like an algebraic formula in which many quantities need to be filled in to get the complete picture. And the complete picture, my friends, is revolution with a capital R. In this book alone, The Phen Phenomenology of Mind Alone, which Hegel described as my voyage of discovery. It feels like it when you read it. It feels like a voyage, a, a man who's, who, who's, whose mind is gradually expanding into higher stages. And if you read it from a materialist point of view, which is what you must do, you can see there all of human history is reflected in that book. Roman history, the, the Renaissance, the French Revolution, Luther and the, and, the, and the Reformation. It's all there in the most peculiar way. But let's, let's part company with Hegel for a moment and pass on. Now, the first question that one has to ask is, why do we have to study philosophy? I'll go further. Why do we need theory at all? Surely, if we are materialists, practice is higher than theory. Practice is the thing. Oh, no, don't have to spend much time talking about general ideas. What's that got to do with practice? Well, you, you might ask, you know. For example, does a worker need to study Marxist theory to, re to lead a strike in a factory? Do you need to study theory to put your socks on when you get out of bed in the morning or brush your teeth? No, of course not. There are a whole, whole series of normal human activities that, that do not require any such thing. But uh, if we are genuine communists, genuine Marxists, are not miserable, sloganizing idiots, you know, look, what, what do we want to do with our lives? What are, we, what are we doing here in this hall today? We wish to change the world. That's a big task, you know. It's not a small task. It's, a, it's with many complexities. And a task as vast and complex as that requires a rather more serious study than putting your socks on in the morning or even leading, leading a strike. In order to change the world, my friends, in order to change this society, you first have to understand it. If, otherwise, you will, you will never change it. And yet some people think, no, some, some, some people think, no, you don't need, don't need to, any theory. You know, Marx was a very patient man. Very rare, a nice, not, he was a nice person, actually. Very rarely lost his temper. I only know of one occasion that I know of, that there might have been others, there's only one I know of, and it's related by another Russian revolutionary democrat. Marx, was, Marx, and, Eng Marx and Engels were in touch with the revolutionary democrats, the Russians. A man called Anenkov. Anenkov relates in his memoirs that when Marx was a young man, he was like you, he was a young person, and he was a member of a small little group called the, the Communist League, I think it was called, which was led by a German man called Weitling. You might have heard of Weitling. Weitling, yes. Weitling was a utopian socialist, actually. And he was actually a worker, an artisan, I think. I'm not quite sure what he did. But <laughs> Marx and Engels joined his group, his small group of workers. And for the first time, they tried to give it a more conscious expression to raise the level, to, to create cadres, if you like. And uh, Weitling wasn't very pleased <laughs> about that because he didn't have any theory. And he felt, he felt rather upset about it because he was the leader, you know. He was the leader. Who are these guys come, come stepping on my toes, you know? So in this conversation with Marx, Weitling tried a little bit of emotional blackmail. I've seen the thi this thing so many times. You know, uh, these intellectuals from university, young kids telling us workers what to do. We are workers. We don't need this. We're practical, practical people, you know. Marx lost his temper. He banged the table, much harder than that, by the way. Uh, Anikov jumped, and he shouted the following words at, at, at Weitling. Ignorance never helped anybody. Remember those words, my friends. Ignorance never helped anybody. So when these clever dicks come along, these workers, oh, the working class this, the working class that. Most of them are lousy, petty bourgeois, by the way. Remember that incident with Weitling. And remember Marx's words. Ignorance never helped anybody in this life. But you see, 
Hegel had something to say about this. <laughs> and this is from his shorter logic. I'll have a, a few words to, to say about Hegel's logic, the science of logic later on. But he wrote, the science of logic is quite a difficult work, as I'll explain. It's in two volumes, a big thing. But he also wrote a shorter logic. It's sometimes called the shorter logic. It's the first part of a trilogy called the Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences, actually. Yeah. Uh, and it's a wonderful work. Uh, I am convinced that when Engels wrote The Dialectics of Nature, he drew very heavily on Hegel's uh, shorter logic. And you, 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 it's still, it's not, an, I'm not, I don't want to kid you, it's not, none of Hegel is an easy read. But it is somehow more concrete and more, more accessible than the, than the big logic. I'll say that. So you might, have a look, you might have a look at that one day. But anyway, in the shorter logic, he says the following. This is, I find this quite amusing about the need for theory. I quote, everybody knows that to make a shoe, you must have learnt and practiced the craft of the shoemaker. Although every man has a model in his own foot and possesses his hands, the natural endowments for the operations required. <laughs> he says, for philosophy alone, it seems to be imagined, such study, care, and application are not in the least requisite. What did he mean? Well, let me put an example to you. You see, this idea, and I'm very, very sorry to say, I have heard this idea expressed by our own comrades who ought to know better. I have heard it. Oh, no, well, theory, no. Practice, practice, not theory, practice. Okay, okay. This stupid idea is contradicted by our everyday experience of life itself. Example, I go to the dentist. I sit down in a comfortable chair. Ma man comes in with a white apron, puts on some soothing music to soothe my jangling nerves. He says, good morning. Let me introduce myself. I haven't seen you before. I have to tell you, I have never studied dentistry. I really know very little, if anything, on the subject. But I'm willing to have a go. <laughs> Open up. <laughs> I think I would make a quick dash for the door. Right. Or just imagine in your house, your central heating is giving trouble. The radiators are not working. You know. Doorbell rings. In comes a man in a blue overall. Carrying a heavy bag of tools, he opens the bag, opens the bag, pulls out a big hammer. Says, well, I've never actually studied plumbing, but let's solve it through practice. Where, where's your central heating? With this, with this, waving his hammer. I think I'd show him the exit, the exit very rapidly. I think I've said it, said enough to show the complete damn stupidity of the idea that you don't need theory. By God, you do. And why should Marxism be any different? Oh, but it is, it seems it is, you know. What Hegel said, he used the word philosophy. We can put the word Marxism instead. What do I mean? Well, I've seen this for many years. All kinds of people, university professors with letters after their name, you know, doctors of philosophy, write big books about Marxism, how bad it is, how wrong it is. When you read these works, you immediately understand that these authors have not read a single word of Marx. Or if they have, they haven't understood a single word. It amounts to the same thing. And uh, that's bad enough. That's bad enough. But even worse, even worse than that, I've met some many so-called Marxists who, are, who equally show me that they're ignorant of Marxism in general and Marxist philosophy in particular, you know. Some people imagine that if you learn a couple of quotes from Marx and Lenin and Trotsky and you apply them to any given circumstance that suits you, you don't have to study uh, facts or anything like that. Uh, 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 and they, th they think that that's dialectics. That's not dialectics. And that method has got absolutely nothing to do with Marxism. Or rather, it, 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 you could say it's a, a kind of dialectic, but it's the dialectic of sophistry, of sophism. You know, the sophist, the sophist will produce a series of clever arguments to justify anything you like. Anything you like, they'll justify. Now, look, we are often told by our enemies, you need to base yourself on the facts. And they think that that's clever. They think that disposes of Marxism. It does not. Marxism does not neglect the facts at all. By the way, 
the, the kind of mental laziness which immediately jumps to a conclusion, a, 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 an idea conceived in advance, never mind about the facts, never mind about the facts, ignore the facts. Our preconceived idea is this. That has nothing in common with Marxism. And it is actually an extreme form of mental laziness. Do Marxists ignore the facts? Read, read the first volume of Marx's Capital or any of the volumes. You find a mass of facts, of this, a mass. Marx actually says in one of the introductions, I can't remember which one it was. He says, and I'm quoting from memory, but I'm sure it's correct. He says, I omit a general introduction. That's to say, the kind of introduction which tells you in advance what he's going to say. Like the PhD students in university, you know, they a big, big thick uh, thesis. Um, before that, they show you a little introduction which tells you exactly what they're going to say. Okay, Marx says, I leave aside, I, 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 I've, I've dropped the idea of a general introduction because it seems objectionable to me to prejudge the results in advance. You must study things carefully. That's the scientific attitude. Accumulate all the necessary facts and figures, and you draw conclusions from those facts. Yeah, but of course, that's not sufficient to say that. There are very definite limits to what is known as empiricism, the empirical method. By the way, it isn't just capital that uses a load of facts. The same is true of Lenin's imperialism and Trotsky's revolution betrayed, the revolution betrayed by Trotsky, okay, and many others. Yeah, but the facts in and of themselves are completely insufficient to gain an understanding. You need something more than facts. But you, you, must, you first of all accumulate the, 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 as much facts as you can. But see, you see, first of all, and you know, these universities, the enemies of Marxism, these academics, they produce book, books full of facts, facts which prove, which prove this, and facts which prove that, allegedly, allegedly, supposedly. Okay? What they don't say is that the facts do not select themselves. The same facts can actually prove different things depending how they are selected. And an individual fact, individual fact, will tell you nothing at all. It's only when you establish a connection between all the facts, you reveal the internal interrelationships, dynamic relationships, you see, you, you then see, you're no longer looking at a, a, a mass of facts, like a sack of potatoes, but a process and a law a law image from the facts you proceed to the law. That's the essence of the dialectical method. And therefore, I've got a saboteur under the table here. What's he doing? Oh, well, one assumes he knows what he's doing. From, the, from, from not isolated facts, but processes, you generalize from the facts. And if you do that correctly, you should be able to make predictions. Now, not necessarily precise predictions, but more or less, you should be able to make predictions. I'll come back to predictions in a minute. Now, where am I? I'm getting lost here, aren't I? Yes. Dealt okay. with that? Yes. By the way, no, that's a separate discussion. You, you, you can make certain predictions. Now, the question is, it's often put to us, you say Marxism is a science. Is Marxism a science? I answer, yes. Oh, yes. Marxism is definitely a science. It's scientific socialism. But you see, there are sciences and sciences. Some scientists, are, some sciences are regarded as exact sciences. I suppose mathematics might be included, I don't know. Or astronomy, for example. Others are less exact. Some are not exact at all, or very, very, not hardly exact. But astronom an, astro an astronomer, for example, can, through his observations, can make a prediction as to the position of a particular object in space, a distant galaxy, for example, 10 million years from today, or more, a billion, a billion years. And, and that prediction will be, will be exact. Well, Marxism is not that kind of a science, but it's not the only science. Let's take, for example, geology. That's considered, to be, it is a science, but you can't, you can never predict exactly when an earthquake is going to take place. You can predict that it will take place at a certain point, in the Earth's surface, but they can't, they can't predict when it will happen. And how can you conduct experiments in relation to earthquakes in a laboratory? So a bit different, difficult, I would have thought. Or take, for example, medicine. Is medicine a science? Well, it is. But again, it's not a precise science. For example, you go to the doctor and you explain certain symptoms. The doctor, I'm assuming, is a competent. 
That's, I know that's a lot to, to hope for nowadays, but okay. But the doctor then will examine all of the all the available symptoms. One, he will compare that to his knowledge, his general knowledge he's accumulated in the past, and on the basis of that information, he can make a prediction. He can make a diagnosis. If it's a stomach ache, for example, and you go to the doctor, it might be colic, it might be a, an ulcer, it also might be cancer. He doesn't know exactly, but he, on the basis of probability, he will make some pr a prediction, and he can be wrong. Dangerously, disastrously wrong. But the fact that one makes a, an erroneous diagnosis, the fact that you make a, di a wrong diagnosis, does not mean that medicine is not a science or that the methods which this man has, has, has adopted are incorrect. It doesn't mean any, any such thing. Let's take the predictions that we make, for example, in perspectives document. A perspective document is not just a, a, a mass of statistics. Some commas seem to think that it is or ought to be. Some commas love graphics and graphs and, and charts, long charts of figures. Maybe they tend, they, tend to make, they tend to give me a headache, but there we are. That might have a role to play. But a, a mass of facts, undigested facts, is not an analysis. And some commas I regret, they imagine that it is. They fill their articles with a lot of statistics to, without, without any real understanding what these, what these statistics actually mean. And uh, is I going to say, listen to the, the facts, yes. Hegel, I've got to quote you from Hegel, which I must try to find with your permission. Yes, we proceed, as I say, from the facts to the law, from the particular to the general. That's the dialectic. And uh, let's have a look where I stand, quote from Hegel. That's fine, it's a marvelous quote. Marvelous. Oh, yeah, here's a quote. As Engels pointed out by the, when Engels, Engels referred to Hegel, he said, Hegel, unlike his followers, did not rely on ignorance, but what, what was one of the most erudited thinkers of our time. Now, where the hell are we? He, he also said, by the way, it's a good one. He said, when I say all animals, that's not yet zoology. Zoology is much more complicated than that. Ah, here we are at last. This is a wonderful quote from the introduction. Hegel's introductions are all well worth reading, all of them. Here's a very good one, a good, a very good, the introduction to the, uh, to the philosophy of history, well worth reading. And he says here, it is in fact, it is in fact the wish for a rational insight, not the ambition to amass a mere heap of acquirements, facts, that should be, pre that should be presupposed, that should be presupposed in every case as possessing the mind of the learner in the study of science. What a wonderful phrase. The wish for a rational insight, that's the point. Not just, not just a jumble of facts. What do they mean? What processes are being revealed? Very important to bear that in mind. From the particular to the general. Here's a quote, a marvelous quote from a, a marvelous book by Trotsky, which I take it that you've all read. His autobiography, My Life. And he's, he's, he's referring to himself as, a, as, a, very, as a, young, a young man. He says the following. Beyond the facts... I looked for laws. Naturally, this led me more than once to hasty and incorrect generalizations, especially in my younger years when my knowledge, book, book acquired, and my experience in life were still inadequate. And here's the point. But in every sphere, in every sphere, barring none, I felt, this is wonderful, I felt that I could only move and act when I held in my hand the thread of the general. Well, Trotsky's words, is, you need to think about that. That's precisely the relation between, between theory and practice. He said, he said, in every case without exception, I only felt that I could move and act in practice when I felt in my hand the thread of the general. That also is essential to dialectics. From the particular to the general, and then back, from the general to the particular. That's the essence of dialectic, the dialectical method as a matter of fact. Now then, is Marxism a science? I've dealt with that more or less. So we, we, we've established here that the Marxist method is not a, a series of undigested facts, but the establishment of processes and laws. We must study things not as they are. You see, we're constantly told this by our enemies, by the stupid bourgeois and the stupid reformists. 
No, no. How, how often have you heard this in the past period? For years and years. We talk about revolution. They look at, look at us as if we are from the men, men from the planet Zog. Yeah. We scratch their heads. Well, what do you mean revolution? What do you mean revolution in Britain? What do you mean revolution in the United States? Are you people utterly mad? Look at the facts. Look at the reality. Open your eyes. Well, we, we, we did look at the facts. And we looked at them rather more carefully than our enemies. But you see, we must study, we must study things not just as they are, but as they were, as they are, and hopefully as they necessarily will become. And that is precisely what the method of dialectics teaches us to do. Now, as I've said, of course, you can say that it is much more complicated to make predictions about society and people than maybe certain aspects of, of nature, the movement of insects, birds, and so on. Also quite complicated, by the way. But the, the argument comes back to us, especially from the, the, uh, the postmodernist imbeciles. How? You can't, there can't be any law. There's no law. They, they say this. There's no laws in nature. There's no laws in society. People are too complicated. You, you, don't, know, you don't know what I'm going to do. Though. You lot don't know what I'm going to do next. I might decide I've had enough. I'll leave the platform and go, go and get drunk. Why not? <laughs> go down the beach. I, I could do. Don't laugh. I could do if, if you push me, push me too far. You don't know. You don't know what. Who knows what an individual, what crazy thing an individual, an individual is going to do? That's true. But as Engels pointed out, he said, "Look, insurance companies can never predict what people, are, how long people are going to live. An, an individual person, they can't predict it. They can't predict it. But in the in the aggregate, very large number of people, clients they've got." They make very precise pres uh, uh, predictions, and that's how they can make a profit. It's, it's the same thing. Like, uh, you can't predict the, uh, the, the, the position and momentum of an individual molecule of gas. You can't do it. They can't do it. A single, a single one, you can't predict it. But a mass, a huge amount of gas, yes, you can predict its, its, its behavior very, very precisely. And even this nonsense of Heisenberg, you know. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all, all of that so, uh, proves to me the, the, the so-called indeterminacy principle, that so, uh, shows to me the very fluid and unpredictable nature of uh, subatomic particles which are constantly moving at very, very, very fast speeds, that's all. And it's, it's what Heisenberg said is true. It is impossible to predict with the necessary degree of accuracy the position and momentum of an individual subatomic particle, an electron, for example. That's true. But quantum mechanics, which he's supposed to have invented, makes very precise predictions when you're dealing with a huge number of, of these particles. By the way, that's known in dialectics as quantity and quality, which Hegel uh, developed that idea. He didn't invent it. You find it in Aristotle's uh, metaphysics, actually, quantity and quality. But Hegel e elaborated it to a very high degree. Of course, uh, it's true. Human behavior is... Complicated? Human behavior is complicated. And there are many elements in, in our perspectives which are variable, and you can't always predict those elements. Some variables are fairly predictable. Others are not predictable at all, you know. And therefore, you can make mistakes as a result of that. Accidents play a role, an important role, in history and in nature at all levels. But as Hegel pointed out, necessity expresses itself through accidents, which is a wonderful dialectical law. I say, but perspectives can be falsified. And you must not make a fetish out of any perspective. Any perspective can be falsified, even by the greatest genius, like Trotsky himself. In 1938, Trotsky worked out a perspective based on the facts as he saw them at that particular time. He attempted to predict how things would de develop during the war, which was inevitable. But you see, the fact of the matter is, listen to what I'm going to say, Trotsky's perspective of 1938 was completely falsified by history. It was wrong. For example, he thought the Soviet Union would be defeated in the world. It wasn't defeated. So, so Trotsky made a mistake. He wasn't the only one. Even the greatest genius could, could never have predicted the peculiar development of the Second World War. It's impossible. Stalin made a catastrophic mistake, which nearly led to the destruction of the Soviet Union. 
when he signed a pact with Hitler, thinking that uh, that would protect him against a German attack in 1941. With, with the result, when, Hit, when, Hitler, when the German forces attacked, millions of Soviet soldiers were killed and taken prisoner. Millions. And Hitler's forces advanced right to the gates of Moscow. You know, it's, it's amazing. That was a, a bad mistake. An even bigger mistake was made by Hitler himself, who thought that he, completed, he would easily be, defeat the Soviet Union. Instead of that, he was defeated, thanks to the nationalized planned economy. And the fact that the, the, the majority of the Soviet workers remained loyal to the revolution. I see, now, now these days, they're, they're, they're celebrating the Normandy landings and so on. Big, they make a big fuss about the role of the British and the Americans and so on. I note, by the way, that the Russians were not invited to this celebration. I wonder why. Yeah. That's a scandal, actually, if you think of it. It's, it's criminal. Because the truth of the matter is, for most of the Second World War, the British and Americans were mere spectators. And Hitler was defeated not by the British or by the Americans, but by the Soviet Union and the Red Army, which tore the guts out of, the, out of Hitler's forces. In Stalingrad and then the Battle of Kursk, the Normandy business was a little, a little stroll in the park compared to that. But the, this changed everything. And Trotsky couldn't change his perspective because he was dead, for goodness sake. If you're dead, it's difficult to change your perspective. You know, it's a complicated thing to do. Churchill's perspectives were wrong. Roosevelt's perspectives were wrong. So Trotsky was in good company. But you see, uh, even the best perspectives can be falsified. Trotsky made a mistake. Yes, yes. But it was, it was a mistake. It was not, not a mistake of method. The method was correct, absolutely correct. It was a, a, a mistake of fact, certain facts which he couldn't have predicted. And we leave that to one side. And now we come to the important bit. How does this discussion affect the question of consciousness? And here we, we, we come to the uh, two great schools of philosophy, which comrade uh, Hamid dealt with in his very uh, admirable lead of the other day. And right through the centuries, right through the centuries, there have been two major schools of philosophy. Idealism and materialism. There have been others which are, how shall I say, uh, in the middle, but, but leave those. These are the two main schools. For the idealists, like Hegel, <laughs> ideas, or the idea, are the main propelling force of human history. Ideas determine, whereas the materialists say, no, the idea, ideas, are, ideas are merely a reflection of material reality. And matter is primacy. Matter is primacy. Human consciousness, far from being a progressive force, which is pro propelling history forward, it's the opposite, actually. Human consciousness, by its very nature, is profoundly conservative. You must get your idea, your head around that idea. That's a major reason why, up until now, the revolutionary communist uh, tendency, if you like, has been unable to convince the masses whose minds were, were, were affected by objective conditions that were favorable to capitalism and unfavorable to any idea of revolutionary change. And you must understand, the great majority of men and women do not like change. They're afraid of change. Change is dangerous. You know? And this, this comes, this is deeply seated in the human psyche. It's actually a def kind of defense mechanism which comes from the prehistoric times, from, from the cave, the cavemen, terrified of, 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 of everything, of thunder and lightning and any, any unusual thing, made people afraid. So the natural defense mechanism is to avoid all question of change, keep things as they are, keep things quiet. All I want is a quiet life, that's all. And it takes great changes, great explosions, for this profound innate conservatism to be shaken and for people to begin, men and women to begin to question ideas which they never, they never questioned before. They accepted unquestionably. That is precisely what's taking place now. For the first time in all countries, men and women are asking, well, is this right? Can we, can we really trust our leaders? Can we believe what's in the, on the, in the press and in the television? Are they not telling us lies? Because what they say doesn't square with what, what, what we see. And these politicians, they, they don't represent us. You'll see that in the British 
Alexis, Rob showed me some very interesting statistics showing the profound sense of alienation of millions of people in Britain from the present elections. They don't, don't want to know. They don't trust. Don't trust the politicians. None of them. Don't trust the police. Don't trust the judges. Don't believe anything. But see, this is the beginnings of a revolutionary change. It's what Trotsky described in a, a, a brilliant phrase. The molecular process of socialist revolution. And that's not reflected in the facts on the surface. It's uh, deep, deep beneath, the, beneath the surface. Silently burrowing away. Yeah. Can't see it. Can't touch it. Can't smell it. But it's there all the time. Marx was very fond of using an analogy with a little furry animal. I once caught one. I don't know how I did it. I once caught one in the garden. A mole. A mole. A blind little, very fast, but a bit, very difficult to catch. You better. Burrowing away under the surface. You don't see this little creature. You see the, the hills that it makes. And when, it's, when it suddenly bursts forward, f forth, in a, in a revolution, as in 1848, Marx shouted, Well dug, old mole, well dug. He could see it. That's our advantage over these miserable empirics who can't see further than their own role. Let's have the facts, let's have the facts, let's have the facts. As Heraclitus said, I think I quoted it the other day, I'll quote it anyway. Repetition is the mother of learning. What a wonderful genius Sir Heraclitus was. I've got his collected works in my library. It's about 30 pages. Yeah. Fragments. Fragments. But what profundity. What, what profundity. He says, eyes and ears are bad witnesses for men with barbarian souls. As I said, the word barbarian means someone who doesn't understand the Greek language. In other words, in other words, it's pointless looking at all these facts when you cannot understand what these facts actually mean. You, you don't understand the language. We do understand the language. That's, that's the difference. <laughs> now, where are we? I must be careful. I must be careful. Of course, we, we, we know that uh, things like tradition, habit, routine, religion, they play an enormous role. It, it weighs on people's consciousness. It's, it's like, like a, a thick crust which stops this revolutionary ferment from developing. Yes, but of course, at a certain point, this, uh, the tension becomes unbearable, and all these traditions and habits are burst, burst apart. And you get the, the sudden emergence of the masses onto, this, onto, the, the, onto, this, onto the stage of history. And dialectics also teaches us something else. Sooner or later, Everything changes into its opposite. Strange idea. Perfectly true. Including consciousness. You know, I, might, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day. I'll say it again. It doesn't matter. The Bible actually says, to quote, you thought I'd forgotten about the Bible, didn't you? <laughs> don't, you don't escape so easily. For the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That's a dialectical experience. Uh, but you see that in every strike, in every strike. You ask any worker, there may be some in, in the meeting here today, I don't know, anyone that's been through a strike. And you get su tremendous surprises because men and women that you never thought would be radical or revolutionary or would play a, 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 an active role in the strike, they suddenly change. And they become the most active fighters, the most enthusiastic, the first on the picket line. The boldest in clashing with the police, men and women, especially women, especially women. Why? You know, a strike actually is like a revolution in miniature. Oh, yes. You, all the, pr the processes you can see in a revolution, you can see in a strike. To put it differently, a revolution is like a strike on a vast scale, on a far higher level. It's true. But in a strike, you see, men and women used to a life of drudgery, monotony, Routine, senseless repetition, always obeying orders, being ordered around by somebody else, do this, do that, do the other, and obeying out of fear, afraid even to ask to go to the toilet. Oh, yes. Suddenly, they feel themselves to be active, active actors in the drama, if you like. Not, not human beings, not slaves, people with dignity, 
people that can decide things, people that can fight, they lose their fear and they become transformed, partly because they're part of a collective which, provi which provides them with, a, with an infusion of courage and confidence. Yes, that is the meaning of a revolution, where men and women, where the slaves cease to become slaves and become genuine human beings with a brain, with a mind of their own, with a heart, with a soul, and so on. These th this is known. Any worker knows this. And very often the small number of activists, so-called activists, are taken aback. They don't, they don't understand it. Well, how can this happen? Because they have not understood the way in which the working class consciousness develops. Trotsky wrote quite a lot about this in his history of the Russian Revolution. You should read that. Now, yes, that's right. You see, uh, uh, because many of the so-called activists in the, tr the trade union branches and the political parties supposed to be advanced, quite a few of them are quite nice people, they're quite good, I mean, they, they, they mean well, but they are not Marxists, and therefore they have no real, although they're workers, they're workers, but they don't understand the working class, and they develop a kind of dismissive attitude. Oh, they will never move, oh, don't talk to me. Look, I call a trade union branch meeting, how many turn up? Only half a dozen, same people all the time. Never change, they never change. How many times, how many times have I heard that expression? And when suddenly the change occurs, the eruption takes place, there's a mass meeting and people are demanding action. The so-called advanced people are taken aback. Quite often they act as a break on the process because they have no dialectics, because they don't understand the way in which people can change. A most important uh, lesson again from, from the uh, algebra of re revolution, if you like. Now, it's, too, it's true, Lenin said once, I think somebody quoted that the other day, he actually said, an ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. Did Lenin say that? Oh, yes, he said it okay. And he meant it. And he was quite right. But he was referring to the masses, not to members, not to communists. And for the masses, it's true. You know, the workers, uh, a worker, for example, here, wherever, Turin, London, or anywhere, Buenos Aires, anywhere. You know, they, they, don't, they don't take the ideas from books. They don't read books. Most of them don't even read the newspaper in normal times. If they buy this, just to read the sports page. Why? Is it because workers are stupid? Workers are not stupid. It's because of the conditions of life of the working class. Understand, material conditions. A worker that's been working 8, 9, 10, 12 hours overtime, hard work or boring work, comes home and the last thing that he or she wants to do is to read a book. They fall asleep in front of the television or go down to the pub and uh, have a few drinks to forget about their problems. Okay? That's because of the conditions of life. But let there be a strike or something occurs. And these people change drastically. I've seen it myself. I've seen it in, in different countries at different times. Suddenly, the work is normally they don't talk about politics in the factory. Suddenly, they start talking about politics. They take an interest. Real politics. And that's where, where our strength lies. Now, uh, by the way, workers are not like little, little ignorant children. They need clever people to come and explain the facts of life. Not at all. Very often, you know what happens? What's, it's happening now in London in, the, in this electoral campaign. We, every, every, every day we get the same experience. There was a, Rob was saying there was a, a, a young worker that we met, a railway worker, and after one, one discussion, he joined the organization. <laughs> And the commons explained the basic ideas of communism to him. I said, yeah, he said, you know, this, this, this has changed my life. But very often, they, they will say, very often they'll say, well, you know, what you were saying, I always thought that, but I, I couldn't put it into words like you put it in. You t in other words, we're telling them what they already instinctively feel. Now, that, that's a fact. That's, 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 again, that's our strength again. And that's, that's what a revolution is good for. Now, I have a little confession to make to you, a little confession. When I started, I started out quite early as a communist. When I was 14 years of age, I'm from a communist family anyway. I went to Swansea Public Library and I got hold of the first volume of Capital. And I read the first hundred pages and I came to the following conclusion, that nobody could ever understand this book. <laughs> I've read it since and it's a lot clearer. But... <laughs> 
But anyway, I started to study Marxism, and uh, I read Anti During quite early on, and I read the Dialectics of Nature and so on. And the brilliance of uh, the idea of dialectical materialism really struck a chord. And I read something that Engels wrote. He wrote the following. Les Engels, you've heard of Engels, he's a German chap, you know, friend of Marx. Anyway, uh, Engels, Engels wrote the following. Okay. Listen to this. Listen carefully to what he wrote. The laws of, of his dialectic, this Hegel's dialectic, are nothing but the most general laws of motion and change in nature, society, and human thought. Shall I repeat that? I'll repeat it. Listen to it again. The laws of his dialectic, this Hegel, the laws of Hegel's dialectic, are nothing but the most general laws, laws, laws of motion and change, motion and change, of nature, society, and human thought. Do you know what that means? I know what it means. That's the laws of everything. And I thought to myself, well, I thought it was true. The laws of dialectics struck me as being, being true. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. But I, I have a confession to make to you. I never really believed that it could be proven. Least of all, it couldn't be proven mathematically. I mean, that's, that's a huge assertion. The laws of motion of everything, without exception. How can you prove such a thing? I thought there was no, well, I, I think it's right, it's true, but I, how could it be demonstrated? And I thought it would never be proven. I was wrong. It has been proven, and not by Marxists either. You know, there's been a, a very interesting developments taking place in science. I dealt with them to some extent in Reason and Revolt, which some of you might have read. You should read that book, by the way. It's by a promising young author. <laughs> and uh, there's all kinds of, like chaos theory. That's an interesting, that's, that contains a dialectical idea, it's clear. And other, other and derivatives, like complexity and uh, ubiquity, that's, do you know what ubiquity means? Yes. How is your Latin? Hands up all those who know Latin. One. <laughs> One. There must be more than one. Claudio, put your hand up. You know Latin. You're a clever man. He denies it. I had to learn Latin. I went to a grammar school, Swansea, Swansea Grammar School. Motto of virtue and good literature. Five years compulsory Latin. We, had a, a, we made up a little poem about that, if I remember correctly. Shall I tell you what it is? Shall, 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 shall I tell you the poem? Yes? I think it's a yes. All right. Latin is an ancient language, as old as old can be. It killed the ancient Britons, and now it's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Rather nice language, actually. Anyway, why, why, am I, why am I saying these things? I can't imagine. Ubiquity, yes. Ubique in the Latin language means everywhere. Ubiquity is everywhere. Ubiquity is something that's everywhere. I mean everywhere. And there's a very interesting book called, guess what, Ubiquity. It's called Ubiquity. Very interesting book. I recommend you to read it by an American scientist called Mark Buchanan. And this book, this book points out that a, a huge number of, of phenomena, different, very different phenomena, as, as different, for example, as heart attacks, avalanches, <laughs> forest fires, stock exchange crises, wars, he doesn't say revolutions, but it would apply also, the rise and fall of animal populations, the movement of traffic in cities, and even, get a load of this, even changes in style, in, in, in dress, and in art and music, okay, are all expressions of the same law, which we would say quantity and quality, and can be expressed mathematically in an e equation known as a power law. Now, I, I, I've got no idea what a, what a power law equation looks like because my maths is very poor. But it, it does exist. It does exist. And therefore, this wonderful law which Hegel developed, quantity and quality and so on, it's now been firmly, it's firmly established, it's accepted now, as a universal law. I mean universal. And this is a striking confirmation of dialectics from people that, of course, nothing, nothing to do with dialectics. Now, the need for theory, I think I've made out a bit of it. I hope I've made out a case for it. But, you know, Lenin, as you know, said repeatedly 
that every genuine communist should strive to become a professional revolutionary. Now, what did he mean by that? He didn't necessarily mean someone that was drawing the wages, wages from the organization. Actually, many of the full-timers of the Bolshevik party <laughs> never received a, a penny from the organization because they, they didn't have any money. They had to take jobs in, in, they had to take jobs in things like banks and insurance companies and so on, where they were highly regarded by the employers because they were disciplined and efficient and earned them lots of money, I suppose. But no, I, I think that Lenin, when he said that you must strive to become a professional revolutionary, I think he was trying to say something else. What he meant was, you must <clears throat> strive to dedicate yourself completely and absolutely, heart and soul, to the cause of the working class and the proletarian revolution and the party. That's what, what it meant. And a serious attitude towards the party, Lenin insisted on this, is a serious attitude towards theory. There is a quote from Lenin which uh, is well known, but normally people don't, don't quote all of it, which they should do. I'll come to that in a moment. But to show Lenin's serious attitude towards theory, the fact that he was very far removed from the Philistine nonsense, which, by the way, was the, the position of the economist tendency, which he combated vigorously in the early days of, of the party, he struggled for theory all his life. It's not an accident that in, in, in a very important period during the First World War, which, if you can imagine, was a, a horrific period. You know, sometimes commies complained a bit, you know, about how difficult things are. <laughs> not so much lately. I think things have become a lot easier, haven't they? But they used to complain a lot, unjustifiably. You think you've got the difficulties? You think for a moment of the situation that Lenin found himself during the dark days of the First World War. The collapse of the international. War in Europe, you know. Workers of the world unite. And here are millions of workers in uniform. French, British, Russian, German, Austrian, Italian, slaughtering each other with rifles and bayonets and poison gas. Slaughtering each other. Fighting on behalf of, the, of, the, of their own imperialist nation. Lunacharsky described it in one book that he wrote. I've got it at home. Europe in the dance of death. Workers slaughtering each other. Workers of the world united. It must have sounded a hollow slogan. And the revolutionaries were entirely and absolutely isolated. Entirely isolated. You know, Lenin was in Switzerland. You had the Zimmerwald Conference, which was very small, very confused also. Didn't lead anywhere. But anyway, Lenin was isolated in, in Zurich, actually, in Switzerland. How did he spend his time? Every morning, as regular as, as, as the clock, he'd go to the public library and he spent hours and hours and hours reading a book, Hegel's Masterpiece, two volumes, The Science of Logic. This book is undoubtedly the most complete exposition of the, of the laws of dialectics from start to finish. It's a masterpiece. But it is not an easy thing to read. It is a very difficult thing to read. Lenin described it, he said, it's the best way of getting a headache. But he, but he stuck it in. Stuck it in. Now, to our practical, for practical friends, you know, pra practical. This is obviously a waste of time. In the middle of all this terrible carnage, and there's Lenin with his nose in a book. And what a book. I'll tell you something. What these imbeciles didn't understand. Lenin was preparing for the October Revolution precisely by that means. Precisely by that means. Precisely. Without that, he wouldn't have been half so prepared to write something like State and Revolution, for example. Yeah, no. You can, see, you can see it reflected. You can see it reflected and other things. No, no. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin understood perfectly well what he was doing. But of course, that's not an easy task. Not an easy task. Now, people, you're probably going to go away very disappointed from this lecture. I bet you all came here thinking that I was going to give you a long list of the laws of dialectics, quantity and quality, interpenetration of opposites, and so on. negation of the negation. Why not? And many other things besides. No. No. First of all, it's not possible to do that in the space of uh, an hour. Secondly, I'm going to leave that pleasure to you. <laughs> I mean... Why should poor Lenin suffer on his own? <laughs> Don't you think you lot deserve a headache as well? I think you do. 
You've got to conquer Marxist theory for, for yourself. Nobody will conquer it for you. But you see, it is, it, it is a problem. What should I read? Well, the first thing, of course, you should read all of the works of Marx. Before, before you tackle Hegel, you should really start with all the, the, the marvelous texts of Marxism, anti-during, dialectics of nature. Plekhanov is very good, you know, found f fundamental problems of Marxism and so on. Many things. Trotsky, the ABC of Materialist Dialectic, loads of stuff you could read. The trouble is that the, these, this, the, the material on philosophy in Marxism, I've got Marxist collected works at home. I've read them all. How many volumes is that? I don't know. Not 55 volumes, I think. Yeah, and there's, there's a wealth of material there, but it is scattered throughout all these works. Scattered. And there's not one single work that I know of that, that, but that you could look to to try to explain all of this. A long time ago, when was that? When did they do Reason in the World? When was that done? 95, was it? Yeah, 90, would it be 95, yeah? I, 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 together with Ted Grant, my great friend and leader and teacher, we wrote a book called Reason and Revolt. It was a very difficult period for us at that time, very difficult, for objective reasons. And also we had a terrible split in the organization that we, we, that we belonged to, which we'd created, actually, which we had created. But, and it, it was quite a sizable organization. And Ted and myself, of course, were expelled with a handful of people. We didn't have anything. We didn't have an apparatus, didn't have money, didn't have a paper. I think we had one typewriter to begin with. Everything you see in this hall today, everything you see comes from that. But when we were expelled, we sat down and thought about things. It was objectively difficult. You had the collapse of the, of the Stalinism, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The labor movement moved sharply to the right under Tony Blair and so on. But I thought about it. I thought, well, what, what, what is our duty at this particular moment in history when everyone is, 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 is questioning the existence of Marxism? People like Francis Fukuyama is talking about the end of history. We're surrounded by demoralization and disappointment and so on. I said, okay, it is clear what our duty is. We must start by defending all of the basic theoretical principles of the movement, all of them, starting with philosophy, starting with dialectical materialism. And you know the reaction of our dear friends, the ones that expelled us. They were, they were so cocky at the time. And there was a joke going around, you know. They had a good laugh. Ah, look, Ted and Alan have abandoned the revolutionary movement in order to write books about philosophy. Comrades, just that sentence alone shows the miserable revisionist trash that these people were and are, a complete and, a, a, and a abysmal abandonment of the basic principles of Marxism. Comrades, if we hear today, there's only one reason for it, and it's this, that this tendency and this tendency alone in the world, I repeat, I repeat, alone in the world, I spent all this time fighting tooth and nail in defense of the fundamental principles of Marxism. We've never surrendered one single step, and we were always confident that these ideas ultimately would succeed because they're the only ideas that really serve to explain what's really happening in the world. And this marvelous meeting is the proof of this, and this is only the beginning. But let's go back. Let's go back to what I was saying. If you look at the present position of the bourgeoisie, of the ruling class, you see the senile, the horrible senile decay of capitalism expressed on all sides, not just in economics, the collapse of the economy, not just the disintegration of, of civilization in effect. You see it in the total bankruptcy of art, of music, of culture in general, and as for philosophy, well, I've already said it. You see, think, in, when, the, when, when the capitalist class was a progressive force, 18th and 19th century, they produced great thinkers, Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau, Ricardo, Adam Smith, great thinkers, great philosophers, Hegel, Kant, and now nothing, nothing worth spitting on, nothing worth looking, nothing worth looking at, nothing. And it's only in, 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 when you study the, 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 the depths, I mean, look, this... Dare I mention postmodernism? Dare I mention? Hey, look, look at the miserable trash which they serve up in the universities these days to these poor, unfortunate philosophy students who, as I say, 
my heart bleeds for. You know, a phrase from Hegel comes into my, my head. By the little, by the little with which the human spirit is satisfied, we can gauge the depth of its loss. It's lost. And this is not an accident. It's a fa this cultural bankruptcy and this artistic bankruptcy is one more expression of the senile decay of a system which has outlived its usefulness and must be soon ejected into the, the, the rubbish of history. If I had the time, I don't have the time. But um, you can go into some of these. I remember when I was a student, you didn't have postmodernism then. Thank God. You had other things like logical positivism. But, uh, you see, I read materialism and em empirical criticism before I entered university, so I knew all about it. Or uh, this is a, a book by a man called A.J. Eyre. A.J. Eyre, Freddie Eyre. Eyre, yes. I wrote a little poem when I was in university. I used to write poetry in those days. Would you like to hear it? You can stick air where the monkey sticks his peanuts. So there, with apologies to the translator. <laughs> with, apologies. with apologies to the translator. Anyway, you know this book, Language, Truth, and Logic. I thought, this, this is the same stuff which Lenin answered in 1908. The same arguments of Bishop Barclay. And... Uh, all of this nonsense, it boils down to extreme subjectivism. That's all. Extreme subjectivism. They go back, they, they, these, these guys, they, they, start out, they start out as empiricists. They go back to the famous statement that uh, what they say is this. I know the world through my senses. I can only know the world through my senses. Right. Right. Yes, of course. I can only know the world because I see it. I hear it, I feel it, I touch it, I smell it through my senses. Locke said, and the, the, the originator, the originator of, of, of uh, empirical philosophy, he said, there is nothing in the mind which was not previously in the senses. Correct, it's correct. Yes, but, you see, you must, uh, you must add to that. I interpret the world through my senses, but you must add to that. The world exists independently of my senses. There is an objective reality, material reality. But that's where they started to come unstuck, starting with Bishop Barclay, who Lenin answered. He said, yeah, well, really speaking, I can't know anything about the world. All I can know is my senses, that's all. Take you lot sitting out there. So take you lot. Do you exist? Yeah, because I can see you. But if I close my eyes, you lot have now disappeared. Oh, no, I can still hear you laughing. Well, <laughs> no, 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 this, is, this, this is the basis of subjective idealism, the most miserable and, and uh, empty kind of idealism. And it, that, as, as Lenin explained in, in his book, inevitably leads to solipsism. Do you, know what sol do you know what solipsism is? Again, it's Latin. You guys don't know Latin. Solo ipsus, only myself. Only I exist. You guys don't exist. Only I exist. Right? Okay. Silence. They don't know what to, they don't know what to say. Now. I've left them speechless. But you see, this same, yeah, solipsists. Bertrand Russell was a very bad for English philosopher. <laughs> but he, he had a sense of humor. He had a sense of humor. And he said, he cracked a joke. He said, I once went to a cocktail party and I met a lady who said that she was a solipsist. You know, only I exist. She said she was a solitary, and she wondered why weren't they, why there weren't more of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I say he didn't have a sense of humour. But uh, <laughs> this book, language, truth, and logic, and uh, uh, who I, I took this book. I, I went to. I didn't want to buy it, waste waste my money and stuff like that. I went in the in the in the Christmas holidays. I went to Swansea University Library. I sat I sat in the reading room. I got this book and I opened it. And Ayer's thesis is that we can only know sense contents. Exactly the same with different words and so on. Can only know, only know sense contents. Okay. So, you see, if you follow these guys, accept their premises, then it's difficult to argue with them, you know. So I, I sat there and I patiently worked chapter by chapter. Sense contents this, sense contents that. 
sense contents the other i'm waiting i'm waiting when are you going to say it you passed it you know with more sense contents and more sense finally i think it was chapter 22 <laughs> i was just beginning to lose all hope and suddenly chapter 22 title what are sense contents as ah i got you I got you by the short and curlies. There we are. Yeah. So he, he, he's trying. Of course, the question is this: What are sense contents? Look, can you have sense contents without a central nervous system? No. Can you have a central nervous system without a material body? No. Can you have? Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> again, again. Can you have a material body without a material environment? No. Who will think collapses? But uh, Professor A, instead, instead of admitting defeat, he goes all round the house, all round the house, all round the house. <laughs> and finally, and finally, he finishes up with a wonderful phrase: "Now that we've finally settled this question." <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to the nearest pub and I got drunk, of course. <laughs> Please raise. I thought it was a pub. And I thought I was drinking beer, but I might be quite wrong. <laughs> let's 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 leave that to one side. Anyway, that's just for your amusement. That's just for your amusement. About I could say a lot more, but I haven't got the time now. I've got the time. Bertrand Russell. We've dealt with him. There we are. Postmodernism. Yes, postmodernism. Well, I won't say. I won't spend. I won't waste your time on that. It is a complete waste of time. Who was it? Somebody said it in in the last discussion on philosophy. Some very unkind person. I think it was Jerome. Stand up, Jerome. Where are you, you scoundrel? Yes, it was Jerome. He made a comment about my history of philosophy, which I thought wasn't a bad book entirely. You know, I thought it was quite reasonable myself. But anyway, yeah. He says, "Why didn't you? Why didn't you write a lot more about modern philosophy? You know, finish it off nicely with all this." Jerome, my friend. What have I ever done to you? <laughs> Look, you might not have noticed this. I'm not a young man anymore. My my days are numbered on this earth, and frankly, I don't really have time to waste. And you want to make my final year, years in this world a sea of misery? <laughs> No merci. <laughs> <laughs> we leave it there, please. But these, these uh, postmodernists, you know, no progress. They don't believe in progress. All the same, we're just the same now as what we were in the Stone Age. You know, we, we, we were all very happy in the Stone Age. So. Yeah. Well, why do they? And I, I know why they say that. Because in fact, the present-day capitalist system, there is no progress. There cannot be any progress. Progress has come to a dead halt, and they f even these imbeciles can feel that. But instead of honestly saying, "No, no, the capitalist system is not capable of progress," which would be the honest thing to say, they take refuge in this nonsense that no, we deny all progress in general doesn't exist. Give me a break. And uh, what else? Is oh yes, no ideology. Mustn't have ideology. Well, of course, the bourgeoisie nowadays doesn't have an ideology. It's incapable of. It had a. It did used to have an ideology. It was a progressive ideology. But now it's not capable. No great ideas. No great philosophers. No great nothing. When we say there's a vacuum in politics on the left, that's true. You tell me where there isn't a vacuum. There's a vast cultural vacuum which needs to be filled. Anyway, I think we're coming to the end of my story. Now, this, we did this book, Ted and I. Reason and revolt, and ever since then, I have had an idea about writing a book about philosophy, which would present the ideas of dialectics in a more developed way than what I've done today. Hopefully, in a more understandable way. And people keep asking me, "Alan, where's your book?" I say, "What book?" I'm a busy man, you know. These guys keep me busy all the time. I go to earn my living somehow, but uh, if you were to come to my house, don't all, don't all come to the same at uh, the same time, by the way. On my desktop at home, 
there must be at least, at the minimum, about 200,000 200, words written on the subject. Probably more than that. It needs to be knocked into shape. But every time I try to work on it, I get knocked. Do you know the Rare Fest? You know, the Rare Fest in London, it was in a break. This poor young chap came up to me in the break. By the way, I must apologize to comments if I don't talk to many people in the break. You know, here, I don't speak to many people in the break. It's not rudeness. I would love to, I'd love to talk to all of you. I really would. I really would. But uh, I get a bit tired, you know, because sometimes I need to rest. <laughs> this poor chap comes up behind me. He says, uh, he's a bit timid. But shall I speak to him? I don't know. But he's timid. I'm not, I'm not going to hit him, am I? I don't know. What's he afraid of? He comes up. He says, um, Alan, what, what's your next book going to be? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then he, he, he's a bit taken about that. He has, an, has, has another go. He, has a, he, wants, he wants to start a conversation. So he has another go. He says, well, uh, 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 there are rumors that it's a book about philosophy. And uh, the first is in two parts. And the first part is an analysis of Hegel. And the, the rest of it is uh, something else I can't remember. I said, oh. I said, you know more than I do then. <laughs> <laughs> At which point he abandoned all attempts to <laughs> and went to it. Anyway. I, I do intend, the, the, the comments of the IS, in fairness to my colleagues, my comrades, have given me a, a task and said that this is a priority for me to do. But, but then, for example, I was busy on the manifesto and other stuff, yeah, other things, other tasks emerge. But I, it, 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 it is being done, shall we say it? It is coming. It's coming. Don't get too excited, <laughs> because what I often say is, it's coming, so is Christmas. <laughs> anyway, no, it will be done. It will be done. But I'd better finish, because I, I, I've spoken for too long. I, uh, no, I'm, I'm within my time limit, actually. But you see, to go back to the central theme here, I can't, I can't impress upon you the enormous importance of studying Marxist philosophy. I mean, it, it would be nice if you could read Hegel, but don't start that immediately, because that's, that's not an easy task. It's a bit like, but this is like in general. I mean, people sometimes say, well, it's difficult to, to study philosophy. I, I've never found it myself. I never found it myself. And maybe it's difficult. But look, anything in life that is worthwhile is difficult. Our task here of building the revolutionary international, that's difficult. But it must be done. And we are going to do it. But to go back to philosophy, you see, it's a bit like climbing a steep mountain. I'm thinking about here about re reading Hegel's, Hegel's science of logic, for example. It's, it's like climbing a steep mountain. And I warn you, not an easy task. And you get tired. And you, at a time, you might, many times you feel like turning back. You think, oh, I'll never get to the top. I'll never get. It's hard, difficult. But you see, once you do get to the top, after all the effort that you put into it, you, ask, you find yourself standing on a peak, peak, breathing in the fresh air, cold, pure, fresh air, as opposed to the poisonous fog which surrounds you. And at your feet, in front of your eyes, spread out before you is all the glorious panorama and drama of human history, of all the mysteries of nature, of society, of humankind, of its evolution, all these wonderful things will be at your disposal, within your grasp, once you have conquered and made your possession, and you have firmly in your hands, this marvelous tool, this magic key that can open so many doors, not just in politics, but in your personal life, in all aspects of your life. It's a transformative experience. And therefore, I encourage you to do this. Once you've mastered this wonderful, magical key to human knowledge, and the name of that key, the algebra of revolution, is that wonderful thing, the philosophy of dialectical materialism. <laughs> <laughs>